So in this video, I'm going to be introducing the idea of rate of change, and um, you can certainly learn the, the concept by just watching the video straight through, but I think you'll get more out of it if you actually do what I ask. You know, in the video, I'll, I'll ask you to pause the video and, um, and do some stuff and then come back to the video. And, um, and again, if you, if you, uh, I think you'll get more out of this if you actually do those things rather than just watching the video straight through. So the first thing you need to do is print off um, this uh, worksheet that I have in front of me. It's called the Intro to Rate of Change. It's in the week one module and it's also, um, there's a link to it right above where you um, clicked on this video. So um, if you haven't printed it off yet, I would say, I would um, recommend you go print it off and um, get ready to, to use it. Okay, so um, if you haven't, pause the video and go print it off and then come back and, and when you're ready with the video in front of you, to, you can uh, start the video again. Okay, so the, as the video, as the worksheet says, this is an alien, that's a cute little picture. An alien is standing on a cliff on the surface of the planet Ziforg. It throws a Ziforgian rock off the cliff. Since the Ziforgs are really good at algebra, it is able to quickly derive a formula that gives the height of the rock, h, in feet, based on the time, t, in seconds since the rock left its hand. The formula is recorded below. So, this formula here is a formula that the, above the, the, grant, the bottom of the cliff, I guess, it would be the, uh, where it's coming from. Because no cliff is 50 feet high, so that's where this feet, you get 50. Um, so, um, and this negative three is the um, acceleration due to the, the gravity of Ziforg. Obviously, it's different than our gravity because it's a different planet. So, I did it while you guys are away. Um, did the calculations. If you plug in two for, um, into the equation, you get 98 feet. Um, and uh, here's the the work that I was doing. So hopefully you got 98 feet for the height above the ground after two seconds. Um, so the next thing you're going to do, whoops, is you're going to now, that was just a test to see if you understand basically how to use the equation. So the next thing you're going to do is, um, and this is the real question, what is the velocity of the rock at precisely two seconds after it has left the alien's hand? And there's this little caveat that says, even though Ziforgs are really good at algebra, calculus has not been discovered in Ziforg yet, so you must answer this question without involving calculus. Some of you that had calculus form might know how to answer this um, using calculus, but you're not allowed. So you have to fill it, figure out a way algebraically to answer this question. So that's your next stop, is to um, pause the video and go to the worksheet and see if you can figure out how to calculate the exact um, velocity two seconds. So in other words, if you were to go fast forward two seconds from the throw and somehow measure how fast the rock is moving, that's what we're looking for, is the velocity of the rock. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video and go try that. Okay, so welcome back. Um, now, you may have come up with all kinds of different ideas and there's no way I could possibly Normally, if you're meeting in class, I would um, go around and look at people, what people are doing, and ask them questions, and and uh, maybe even have them present some of their ideas. But most people, when they do this, they begin calculating different heights and somehow trying to use that to find um, velocity. Because we know that velocity is change in um, position divided by change in time. So the only position we have is heights. So you may have thought of something doing like something like this, where you go h of 2 minus h of 1, divide that to minus 1, because this would be one position, I'd be a second position, this would be the time that goes with the first position and the time that goes with the second position. So if we do that, we end up with um, 98 minus 77 divided by 2 minus 1. And of course that would just be um, 21 over 1. So that would be 21 feet per second, which that sounds like a velocity, right? So we'd say that the rock is moving 21 feet per second. But again, then of course, the next question would be, well, is that the instantaneous velocity though? Is that how actually how fast it's moving? 
And of course, if you think about it for a while, you would decide that no, that's not the the um, actual velocity. That's because really, um, if the rock, if we the way we understand gravity, if it works the same way in Ziffold, is that as the rock is falling, it's accelerating, so it's getting faster. So we took a, a isolated two isolated positions and subtracted them to find our distance. And that would, so what we really calculated here was the average rate of change. Average rate of change. And that's interesting, but that, that doesn't give us the instantaneous, like how fast it's moving at two seconds. Um, that just gives us on average how fast it's moving over that span of time from two sec from one second to two seconds so on average it was moving 21 feet per second okay so the next step in this little activity is for you to again pause the video and see if um, there's another way or maybe another way to ask this is um, this is a decent approximation of how fast it's moving so another question I could ask is can you get a better approximation so, again, if you're doing this correctly, I would pause the video now and, and think about how could I get a better, because this is approximation of how fast it's moving at two seconds, but how could I get a better approximation? So go ahead and pause the video and try that. Okay, so welcome back. Hopefully you've come up with some good ideas. Um, one possible idea you might have come up with is uh, the problem with the last one is that the the time we're interested in is right on the edge of this interval. So you may have thought of what if I calculated the height at three seconds and the height at one and use that to find the average height. And if you do that, you end up with 18 feet per second. Um, and that's obviously different. Um, is that better? Well, you might argue that we think it's better because now the time I'm interested in is right in the middle of the interval instead of on the edge of the interval. And if we understand the, the um, the velocity to be increasing because we believe that it's accelerating all the time then it would make sense to if you're taking the average from one second to two seconds we we would believe that at two seconds it's going to be traveling its fastest so using the average velocity from one to two seconds to to approximate the average at two seconds wouldn't really make sense because we know it's moving at its fastest there so now we, it's moving its fastest at three and its slowest at one, and the two is right in the middle. So this, you might argue this is a better approximation. Um, and, and so that's one method, that's one route you might go. The other route you might have thought of is, or another idea that you may have come up with is um, <clears throat> that if 98, if this is a decent approximation, then getting a smaller interval closer to the actual um, place we're interested in would be even better. And notice when I did this, I did it 2 and 1.95. This was 2 and 1. I had 21 now, I have 18.15, very close to this one here. Um, and notice if I was to make this even closer together, like if we did 2 and 1.995 and check that out we get even a smaller or even a, um, we get again another different answer and the idea is that it seems like the smaller the interval is the closer it gets to the actual instantaneous rate of change and if you think about um, if we were to just hop to a slope type thing because really what we're doing here is cal calculating slope i hope you all see that um, I had it written up here earlier, but we were just doing f of 2 minus f of 1, right, over 2 minus 1. You can see that that's y, y1 minus y2 over x1 minus x2, right? Do you all see that? So what we're really doing is just calculating slope. And so if you draw a picture, and I'm trying to get the instantaneous slope right there, right? It looks something like that. If I take two points on the graph and I calculate the slope, let's use a different color. If I calculate the slope, now it's not going to be the same, um, but we could say that it's going to be similar because this, the slope is in that same interval. And notice if I let the points get closer and closer together, 
why the slope begins to look more and more like the actual slope. And the closer these points get to each other, the smaller the interval, as long as it's getting close to, to the thing I'm interested in, becomes closer and closer to the actual instantaneous rate of change. Um, so that's the idea of this activity, is to see that you can use a, an average rate of change to approximate instantaneous rate of change, um, but it will always be approximation until you... Um, but it will always be approximation as long as you have to change. Now, in this one, we actually got lucky because that is the actual, the actual instantaneous rate of change of two seconds is 18 feet per second. And so, because this is a quadratic and we went evenly on both sides, it worked out to give me the, the correct answer. Um, but that's not always going to be the case. If we're not dealing with a quadratic, that would not be true. So, um, so the main idea here is that um, if we're using two points, then we're calculating an average rate of change. Um, if, if we want to know the, the actual instantaneous rate of change, the problem is there's only one point to deal with. We, we, we don't have a, a, a velocity, I mean, we don't have a two uh, positions to calculate it. Um, so, but what we do understand is as the um, interval around the place I'm looking for gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the average rate of change gets closer and closer to the actual instantaneous rate of change, which brings up the limit concept, which is I think some of you have heard before and maybe others haven't, I don't know. But the idea if we take the limit of f of x sub 1 minus f of x sub 2 divided by x sub 1 minus x sub 2, and we let x sub 1 get closer and closer to x sub 2, well, um, this can actually find out what's, this can actually um, calculate the instant, or this is calculating the average rate of change over an interval over and over again, but if we're trying to find out what the average rate of change is at x equals 2, or x sub 2, the the limit, because we can take the limit of this without actually evaluating it, this will get to the instantaneous rate of change. So that's the idea. Um, we're going to explore that idea much more. But first, before we do, we have to we have to talk about evaluating limits. So for the next, the rest of this week, um, you'll be working on um, figuring out how to evaluate limits because we want to be able to evaluate limits in order to for right now, calculate the instantaneous rate of change. So um, hopefully that was helpful. Um, let me know if you have any questions about this. And uh, go ahead and keep moving on through the week one itinerary. So.